All right, so we're on to our next segment. We're gonna have the guys from Mainstay Medical and uh, we're gonna be showing off the Reactivate procedure. So come on in, we'll bring the C-arm down. AJ, if you wanna come in. So we were gonna have Dr. Seville, one of the surgeons in the local area, but unfortunately um, he is not able to make it. So the show must go on. That's right. So I am going to show the procedure and uh, we'll talk it through. We have Jason here from Mainstay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank all the way from San Diego, right? All the way from San Diego. It's the one place in the U.S. that I say has nicer weather than Fort Lauderdale. So we, can, we do what we can. So it's definitely one, two, Philly, yeah, seventy, Philly's much better. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great. We're gonna go through the slides real quick here. Uh, once again, if you have any questions at all, get it out there. Um, we'd love to talk to you. So reactivate, pretty new procedure in the states. Um, we've been you've been commercialized for a year about? Yeah, just a little bit over a year. Perfect. So this device indicated for bilateral stimulation of the L2 medial branch um, of the dorsal rami as it crosses that transverse process. So what are we doing? We're really trying to stimulate that multifidus muscle and reactivate the muscle. And we'll get into how that works. So this is kind of what happens before you get reactivated. Why patients have this chronic lower back problem. You have an injury or an overloading, then you get this inhibition. I think a lot of people don't understand that inhibition. We send patients to PT and we say, activate your core, right? right. And you can't, you, you, there's been studies out there that show you actually can't activate your multifidus as much as you try. Like no one can sit here right now and say, activate your multifidus, uh, even if we wanted to, but then when you have this inhibition, the brain won't even turn on that part, which starts to alter that neuromuscular control. You get atrophy of that multifidus, which leads to instability and lower back pain. So this is the orthogenic inhibition I was talking about. This is why you can't do it. And a lot of people understand it better with the knee for some reason. Um, if you have knee pain, it is known that you'll have atrophy of your quad. And that's not because you're walking around all day saying, don't fire my quad, don't fire my quad, right? Your brain actually won't mm -hmm. fire your quad because of that feedback mechanism of pain. The same thing happens in your back. When you have back pain, facetogenic, discogenic, whatever the pain's coming from, your back is telling you not to fire the muscles around it, which is the multifidus muscle. And this picture in the middle, the blue, green, yellow picture, actually shows that mapping of a healthy patient and a patient with lower back pain and how there's a difference between DM there is deep, deep multifidus and LES is the other lower back spinal muscles where in a healthy patient they can differentiate between the two and for people to understand the multifidus should be firing what we're doing right now as we're just standing walking if I have to lift something or extend that's when the rest of your lumbar paraspinals should start to fire in an unhealthy patient with lower back pain your brain can't differentiate between the two so you're almost exclusively using your larger lumbar extensors, therefore that multifidus atrophies and that multifidus is what stabilizes the spine 80% of your day. You lose that, you start getting dysfunction, you start getting facet pain, you start getting disc pain. And as docs, we treat those pain, right? Absolutely. We're kind of All just masking the issue when we're treating the pain. This will actually restabilize that spine. And I'll talk about in a little bit how it gives you an extra boost to that physical therapy side of things and actually gets these patients healthier. So you're not just trying to treat the primary problem as exactly. opposed to the effects, but you're also hopefully giving the patient preventative care. Exactly. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's great. I love it. So we're gonna go over a little data. I love data. Uh, gonna do it quick here though, because we're more about showing the procedure and talking about some of the physical exam maneuvers. But this is their study against sham. Um, always love companies that go against sham because I think it's very hard to do. One, it's very hard to get it approved. Two, it's hard to get people to sign up for it. And three, it's hard to win that study. Right, and what do I mean when that study is, placebo is when, very powerful. when you set up these studies, you don't know if it's gonna be a good study or not. Right. So it's a big risk and I like companies that take that risk because if you do win that study, that's, that's huge against sham. So what they did was implant 204 patients, turned it on a sub-threshold level in 102 and turned it on at an optimal level, uh, therapeutic level in the other 102. And as you can see, big sham response as we always see in every sham uh, controlled procedure, but then that starts to wear off and then that mark there where they kind of, where the two lines end, they allowed patients to cross over. And I think even more there, what you see is those patients that were in the sham ended up going back down. And I think one of the cool uh, stats you guys told me was that you asked every patient if they thought they were in the sham or not. And I think mm -hmm. something like 60% of patients got it wrong, where it would have been 50. So right. almost everyone, there was no, no one knew if it was on no, or not. It was a toss of a point. Yeah. So I think that's pretty cool that they did that. I always like to ask patients, do you know? This, this slide I'm going to go over real quick, but what's the point of this slide is that there, you could have other, any pathology. All these patients were in that study. They had disc degeneration, facet arthropathy, 
spondylolisthesis, retrolisthesis, disc bulge, modic changes, all these patients can benefit from reactivating. Why is that? As I talk about this all the time, there are two silos. There's a silo where you're treating pain and there's the rehab silo. And unfortunately, all we've had for years in the rehab silo is physical therapy. Right. And you know, acupuncture, cupping, but physical therapy modalities, chiropractic care. Now we have that cap on that silo where we can actually do a procedure to keep this silo going while you can still treat the other pain Absolutely. issues um, at the same time. So I think that's when people ask me all the time, well, would you treat the mode of change or would you do reactivate? You could do both. You could do both. You could do both. Um, one of them, you're just st stopping the pain. The other one, you're trying to stabilize the spine. Um, let's go over the procedure. So this is basically showing where the electrodes are gonna be. I'm gonna show you guys live though, because I'd rather do it live than, with, um, than in the setting of the slides. So let's see what kind of shot we have here. Take a shot there. Okay, great. So pull towards you just a little bit. If we can get that. All right, perfect. So a little bit of a scoliosis in this patient. We've already preloaded a little bit. We cheated a little bit. Um, but what I'm going to show out to you here, and you guys can see my hands here. Um, we have two blocky needles. So where do the, these needles go? It's just like a medial branch block at L2, which is the L3 transverse process, but you're not coming at that oblique angle. You're literally just going straight down onto the junction of the SAP and the transverse process. And these are just giving you twofold. One, a guide of where you want to end up. And two, when you do that final twitch test, you can, if it, the patient's a little larger, it might be a little harder to see uh, the, the muscle actually twitching. So you'll see the needles twitching. So turn the nerve. One thing I tell people all the time, do not put lidocaine down these knees. <laughs> these needles because then you'll turn the medial branch off during your case and you won't be able to stimulate it. So then the next step, and we've, we've, so the right side is going to be the first few steps, but basically you take this needle, the gauge, 20, 18, 18, 18 gauge, 18 gauge needle, and we're going to find our starting spot. And our starting spot is usually right over, take a shot there, right over, see where it's X, that X marks the spot, one more shot, and one more. Good, our starting spot's right there. And that's really over the spinous process of the level below. So since we're at the L3 transverse process, that's going to be the spinous process of L4. And we're going to take that angle now from that moment, and you're going to do a cut down, just like you do the way I describe it. Patients under, or physicians understand that a little better. Same cut down you do with an SCS program, right. right? Exactly. You're going to do that cut down first, not because you're going to put anchors in, but you're going to end up making a strain release loop. So you're going to do that cut down first, and then that's going to be your starting spot. And what our trajectory is going to be is we're going to go lateral from the medial line of the spinous process, trying to hit right on that spinous process marker. And I might, I don't want to, I think we can do it. Okay. Yeah, I'll be able to do it. Shot. So if we look at that left side there, I'm going to pull this needle back just a little bit and then advance it back in. Shot. So I'm going to do most of this in the AP first. So let's say I get there. I'm there and I'm going to advance, advance, advance get over the TP, a lot of times what you're going to do, you want to be as close to that TP as possible. So a lot of times what you're going to do is actually hit that TP mm -hmm. and kind of walk it over the top. And then once I kind of hit the TP, get to this mark, I'm going to go lateral and check where I am. It's nice to not have gloves on. I can help this C-arm tuck down. And this is a straight needle, right? There's no bent angle to this needle nope. that you can utilize. So you have to have a perfect trajectory. You do. And, and take your time doing this. You know, the procedure is the needle in my mind. If yeah. you get the needle in the, in the correct location, everything else is gonna go very nicely. So I'm gonna wiggle this needle, just go live real quick, just so you can see which one we're working with. That's the one right there. So what does our mark wanna be here? And you can kind of see it with the other side. We wanna aim right at the inferior border of L2 there, the posterior inferior border, the vertebral body of L2. That's what you wanna aim at. So we're coming right in there. You see our two blocking needles come down the top. Um, we wanna go right into that border shot. And it's always nice when you already have done one side because you kind of just follow the same shadow. I'm going to push this a little further just so you can see it. And we want to get through the inner transverse sari muscle that lies there. And that's the muscle that lies kind of between the levels, the transverse process levels. You want to punch through that. And why is that? It's because when we're going to put our lead in, and we'll talk about this one more time, but when you put your lead in, this is tough. The guys in the VR might be able to see it a little better. There's bi-directional tines on the end of this lead. And that's why you don't have to anchor because this will actually stick in that muscle once it's deployed through the sheath and you'll, we'll do a push pull test. You'll see it and you'll be able to anchor this into that muscle 
And it's those are very good. I was actually very surprised the first time I did it. So it and, saves you a lot of steps. Oh, it saves you a ton of steps. Yeah, no anchoring. Mm -hmm. I always tell SCS companies the worst part of the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I hate anchor. I'm like someone. Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of years now. They should have figured out like a right, like, right something right, 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 a little right. quicker. So we're in we're in there with the with the needle. The next step is to use a guide wire, and this guide wire is going to give us access to that area so that we can put the sheath over it. Shop. And you can see that guide wire coming through here. So, shot. <clears throat> Good. So it poked through. One thing that can happen if you're not through that muscle, it'll actually deflect cranially, almost at a 45 degree angle. No hurt. It just means you haven't poked through that muscle. It's actually a pretty nice check to know you're through. Um, the other thing I always mark here is people think we're in the foramen, right? But we're not. So let's come back AP. You actually use the foramen as a marking of where you want to be here. The nerve is nowhere near where we are because when we come back AP here, you'll see we're way lateral, right? right? So you see on the left side there, shot, see that, that guide wire coming out? That's where we want that guide wire to be. So the next steps we're going to kind of cheat here. I'm going to pull this needle out. Perfect, shot. So we have our guide wire there. Now the next step, which I'm not going to do live because it, it can be a it's not tough, it's just gonna be a little tough on the models. Mm -hmm. um, and a patient, it actually goes through really nice. You make a nick in the fascia here and you slide the sheath right over. This is just a seven French. Correct. Pretty, so, pretty normal. So I'll get down to the part where we'll, I'll show you, slide it right on. This guide wire, you know, just make sure you're not pushing or pulling it. You want it to stay in that spot and you slide it in here. Actually, shut. I want to get you halfway there. So you can see it kind of will slide right over that needle. I'm actually gonna get there. Shot, but I want to pull it out so we can see the lateral better. And you want to make sure that you get right where you want to be. I usually do this in lateral. I want to stop there. I want to pull this side out though, because we already have it in on the other side, and I want to be able to show the lateral a lot better. And if you're doing a lot of peripheral nerve stimulation implants, this is almost the same kind of approach in terms Very of similar. the tool sets, the guide wires, the tines on the leads, and the introducers. So if you're familiar with that, this is going to be very straightforward for you. Very similar. So we get we got this in on the left side, we'll say. Now we're going to switch to the right side. All I did to get to this right side moment now is I pulled out the guide wire. And we're in the mm -hmm. same location. So take a shot there. So we like what it looks like in AP. Let's go lateral make sure that it's still pointing at that L2 vertebral body. And if it's one of your first cases, I always say this. Imaging is your friend. Time is your friend. That's right. You're not, there's no record you know, that, that you're trying to break. Take a few more images, lateral AP. It's really important because the last thing you want to do is throw the lead in there and it not stimulate the nerve. And the only reason that would happen is you're a little posterior to it and you missed it. So take a shot. But this is perfect. That's exactly where we want to be. Um, we're going right at that inferior border of L2. Um, and now the next step is pretty simple. We take out the interior portion of the cannula. Shot. Perfect. It's a little hard to see without the inferior portion, but now we're going to put the lead down. Shot. And I don't like to go all the way because I don't want to accidentally deploy it. And how does it deploy? So Jason, I think you, you explain this point exactly how we deploy this and how it works to get stuck in there. Shot. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to advance that electrode so that that distal set of tines is just on the anterior aspect of that intransverse eye. And once that's there, just bring that sheath back a couple of centimeters, two, three. And that's going to expose the proximal set. And then I think you're going to be able to actually show us the kind of the pull and push, which is then going to snug those two tines up on either side of that muscle. No, I think that's great. So I like to go AP here because I always check twice before I deploy anything. Make sure nothing moved. What I want to see on the AP, I'm going to give you a little hint here of where we're looking for this, Im this uh, image to be. I like to have the first or second distal electrode right at the level of the superior border of that L3. That means you're gonna cover the whole uh, medial branch, you'll get that stimulation you want. So you can, since we already checked the lateral, you can deploy here. And a lot of people, I think the best thing Jason said there, I wanted you to say, because I'm gonna say it again, is you don't deploy by pushing the lead in, mm -hmm. you deploy by pulling the sheath back. I've seen it, we're in a case, they push the lead in, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, because that's where we want, we want the lead to live there, right? So I don't want to push it in. And once it's deployed, you can move it, but it's, it's a little tougher shot. So there, see how I just pulled the sheath back. We know with the lead that we are, the, 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 the proximal time is just on this side of that distal lead. So we know now the lead's deployed, it's out there. We can take the rest of this out. I always go slow still though too. You don't wanna pull on it too much shot. 
Make sure, you know, we're not moving it too much. When you pull this out, the inner stylet will come out with it as well. Shot. Perfect, and now we can do our push-pull test. And uh, you get in there and tug on a little bit. Actually, go live here. I like to go live here, just to show it off. See how it's, you could actually see it wiggling back and forth there in that muscle. Yeah. Those tines do a pretty darn good job of staying in there. Mm -hmm. Have you issues with migration? So that was my first question when yeah, I met them, of right. course, because I've done some PNS and that's always like that you get the post-op imaging and you're like, yeah, well, it moved. Back um, to the drawing board. So I'll let you answer that because you guys yeah, have pretty no, good stats on that. Absolutely, it's something we're really proud of. Yeah. Uh, at the 204 patients in the Reactive AP trial, there was not a single lead migration. Okay. Yeah. That's so great. We, are in, we are far below 1% globally. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So even uh, commercially, which I always think is the real test, like get mm -hmm. this in the hands of the people who aren't in the study. Yeah. So that's who's going to really start. It's going to with it. Um, not seeing the, the migration is pretty impressive. Uh, that was one of the questions I had. So just to finish up with the procedure part, and I'm going to show off in the last 10 minutes here some of the physical exam maneuvers and talk about patient uh, identification. So there is a battery. This is the battery. Very similar to any other SES battery. Kudos to their company too. They are getting it smaller, correct? Absolutely. In the next right. year, year or two, I, I don't, I don't know the timeline. Don't quote me on any of that. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's a, similar to an SES, and you put it in just like any SES perm, right? Or left side, flank, or in the buttocks. However, the patient likes it. I talked to them beforehand about that. The one difference is that we talked about. There's no anchoring, so you will make something called the strain relief loop, which I'm just going to do outside the body here. Oh no, I can actually put it in there. There we go. Shop. And if you can see on that, come down just a little bit if we have room. There we go. You can see on that C-arm image there, we would have two leads in here, one on each side. You want that down around. That just takes a little strain off those. You don't want it pushing and pulling. And then you tunnel into your uh, flank spot that you'd like to go. This just gets tucked in on the ipsilateral side. So what I do is just make a midline incision, use my finger with a some kind of lap or something. Just use my finger, make a little um, pocket underneath the midline incision and place that in there. And then batteries, just like any other battery. Um, Post-op, you know, I close with just uh, sutures deep and then we use something called a close X or staples or suture, whatever you're, you're happy with on the skin. Um, no antibiotics needed post-op. I don't give anything for pain post-op. Tylenol and ice goes wonders. If a patient needs anything, I would do a day or two of pain meds. Um, they, we don't turn it on though for two weeks. Right. So that's one thing that you really have to talk to your patients about. And we're gonna get into this in the next segment here where we're talking about patient identification where we talk to it now. The patient really has to buy in to the reactivate um, procedure because it doesn't, it's like going to the gym. You're not gonna go to the gym one day and get big biceps, right? You can tell I haven't been to the gym in four years. <laughs> but um, you're not gonna go to the gym one day and get big biceps, right? You're going to, have to work those muscles. And they turn it on for a half hour in the morning, a half hour at night, and the data is showing two to three months is when the patient will start to notice some kind of relief. What patients have told me though is they feel the stimulation and that actually gives them a little sense of relief. But the actual pain relief can take two, three, six months. There's even uh, late responders Correct. that can take up to a year. So uh, shout out to one of the, the colleagues with Reactivate, Rap Heroes. He says he doesn't consider anyone a failure until 12, 12 months. Oh, wow. um, so I think that's great. Um, but the patient has to buy in beforehand, right? You have to have that conversation with beforehand. Mm -hmm. We're not even turning it on until two weeks. So my two week follow up, everyone's like, I'm like, yeah, I haven't, all I've done is actually make two incisions in you, <laughs> you know? So they turn on a two week mark, half hour in the morning, half hour at night, and then I follow up with them six weeks, three months, six months, and 12 months. Why do you wait the two weeks? Just to get them through post-operative period, yeah. to get the scar into play. You no, know, it's, it's a great question. I think it's a combination, right? We're going to be contracting that muscle that's right underneath the incision, and we're going to be contracting that muscle that's going to pull on those tines. And that contraction is actually much stronger than what you would normally see in multifidus just walking around day to day. So we want to make sure everything settles in so right. that we don't have any issues with stability. Okay, that makes sense. So great. Let's. Uh, we have eight minutes left. I think that's plenty of time. We're going to bring in our physical exam. Maneuver guy, and I, I think this is great for Meta Combine to not just show off the procedure, but show off some new physical exams that are out there. I'm going to take this off so I can move a little better. Um, maybe not. I'm going to do that. You're locked in. Jeez. You got to wear it for the rest of the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, so, I'm going to show you guys some physical exam maneuvers 
and uh, how to identify these patients. So on this slide, if we can go back to the slides for the people out there, I know we're bouncing back and forth. We're going to, first on the left, that's one indication, is talking about multifidus atrophy. And you can see in the circle there, those deep multifidus muscles. If you, first of all, I talk about this with every, any time I talk, you should be reading your own MRIs at this point. Mm -hmm. If you're doing anything more than just injections, you need to start reading your own MRIs. So, and you may not, though, have been looking at the multifidus, and that, that's okay. A lot of people haven't been taught that. A lot of people don't, a lot of radiologists aren't looking at the multifidus. But you're gonna start noticing this multifidus atrophy, and what that is is that white coming on there against the spinous process, against the facet joint there, is where it really starts to start. Um, and you'll see that at L4-5, L5-S1 region is where I really look. But we also have physical exam maneuvers that we can do in order to show off uh, or to, to include these patients. And I think the best, a lot of people go to the MRI, go to the MRI. But the B study didn't use any MRI for inclusion. It actually just used the testing. So first we're going to talk about the multifidus lift test. And I, I do something... I like to, the multifidus lift test we can do lying down, but I like to do it actually standing up, and everyone can do it right now. There's a bunch of people in this room, I'm gonna make them all do it, and everyone at home, stand up real quick. So put your thumb right on your L4 area, right on the spinous process, and move it one finger breast to the left, okay? L4 is right in the middle of the back, here. We'll have, so right in the middle there, you're gonna put your thumb right there, just to the left, and you're gonna just bring your right arm up, and down, and you should feel that activate, that it should be bumping out there. If you guys are, I love, I wish I could show the other side, there's six, seven people in this room. Put their arm it's up. It's like we're doing feel, the wave. So, so the wave. if that isn't a strong reaction, a strong punch out there, mm -hmm. then that's when you know there's some multifidus atrophy. Because mm -hmm. you're not activating your, I'm not extending, I'm not lifting anything. That's just your body not falling over, you know, because your the compensatory may not fall over. And then you do the other side, same thing, see if it comes out to you. So that's, that's a quick test I always do to see if a patient is in or out. Basically, I just put both my hands there and put one arm up and one arm down. I think that's great. But then the PIT, the prone instability test, we're going to do here. So usually um, you do it at the end of the table, but I don't think we'll be able to see you guys well. So I'm going to have Tim just lie over the front of the table with his leg. You, you should be good. With his legs on the ground. And what we're going to do is do a glide. I don't know if the next... Slide talks about it a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're gonna do a, a glide at each level and see if there's pain. So, you say you have pain there, Tim? Nope. You have pain there, Tim? Nope. Can we just put this lateral so they can see? You have pain there? Oh yeah, that one. Oh yeah, that's the one. So, and I'm gonna continue down all the way. But that's his L3, L4 area. That's probably L4 right there. And the way I do it is, you don't want to use a bony prominence. That'll actually hurt everywhere. You want to use either the fleshy part of your hand. Just like any other glide you've ever done in the back. The great thing is too, that I, that Mainstay has done for us, they've come and taught our physical therapists, mm -hmm. they've taught our nurse practitioners how to do these tests. So this is just for you to get a flavor. So first we have pain, so boom. That's not a positive test yet, right? They have pain in the back. Next thing you're gonna do is have the patient hold on to the table and say, lift your legs. So you're gonna lift your legs off the table and now they're activating their big muscles in their lumbar spine, and you go through again and say, do you have pain there? Well, there, feels better. there, no pain at all now. That's a positive pit test. What's that telling me? That's telling me that when he's activating all of his lumbar uh, muscles, there's no pain, but when just the multifidus is supposed to be stabilizing, there is pain. Um, so that's a positive pit. Takes, how long that takes? Two minutes? People always complain, these physical examiners mm -hmm. take too long. I'm, this is where we'll get into this again. I'm physical, I'm, PM and R right. training, and your anesthesia. So I, but you, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, you you have to do some sort of testing. Yes. And it gives you a lot of information. Oh, quick, huge. You, you can wait weeks, months to get an MRI sometimes. But if you did an exam, you at least have an ability to make a, a very good diagnosis. So I think if you have a patient with chronic lower back pain and you do the modified multifidus lift test and the PIT test, it gives you an idea of where you're headed. It doesn't mean every patient is going to go into reactivate or that way but it gives you an idea you have to get your hands on the patients guys we always talk about that it's very important to um get your hands on the patient and help them out in that way so i think yes this is the last slide this is the slide where i kind of talk about the silos right mm -hmm. one more time we're for reactivate we're in the restorative silo correct focusing on rehabilitation improving function for patient we're activating that muscle control we're 
teaching the brain again how to activate those multifaceted muscles. And on the palliative side, we focus on masking more of the pain and treatments, you know, injections, opioids, all those kind of things. So overall, I think it's a great new procedure out there. It's FDA approved. Um, you know, you really reach out to you guys. How do they get a hold of you guys to Absolutely. get trained or yeah, get so more information? So they can go to uh, mainstaymedical.com. There is a request more information link right there. Uh, you'll get directed to someone on the team and, and we'll make sure that we, uh, we get out and take care of you. Awesome, guys. Well, I think it's a really cool procedure out there. I think a lot of patients, you know, the one thing I didn't talk about is, is what the age range is for this patient. These aren't the seven-year-old patients. This isn't your spinal cord stimulation age range. These are the 35 to 55-year-olds that want to stay active, want to keep moving. Here in South Florida, have golfers, the boaters, they don't want fusions. They don't want to be on opioids. You know, they want to keep moving. With this procedure, it doesn't it doesn't just mask the problem, it fixes the problem. Mm -hmm. It gets them stronger, gets them moving. It makes it very impressive. The yes. only stimulation device that actually regenerates muscle. Exactly. That's pretty neat. It's pretty yes. cool. Yeah. Very right. cool, guys. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank very you much for coming. Thanks, for Thanks again. You guys are Thanks great. Awesome. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Good job. Good well stuff. Well ah, I think that was, that was a pretty good fill-in. <laughs> Meta Combine, the show must go on. I think you did a great job. Thank you. So we have a moment here where we're going to be having Anna from PNC Bank and you yep. talk a little bit about something that we're starting here at MedEd Combine. Oh, no. uh, a little different education, right? Awesome. Anna, thanks for joining us. Uh, Anna is from PNC Bank and you know, at MedEd Combine we're all about education. Sometimes that education focuses on devices, techniques, diagnosis, but sometimes it's about educating you in terms of helping build your practice or starting a business. And Anna at PNC Bank is one of those experts who can help you understand what is the new climate we live in economically. How, how do you go about, we were just talking this morning about, how do you go about uh, getting some capital or getting a loan and what's appropriate? So Anna, if you want to introduce yourself, talk about a little bit what you do day to day, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I think you just did half of my commercial <laughs> here, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but uh, yes, Anna, I'm here with PNC Bank. Um, you're probably wondering, well, why, you know, how are you healthcare related? What can you do for us? So over 35 years, PNC has a dedicated group that we only work with private practices. Um, myself, my team here, I cover the state of Florida. So. My counterparts are, you know, East Coast from West Coast, so we do primarily um, only specialties such as orthopedics.